Two minutes, please. A week? Yes, in a week. Here's your receipt, sir. Thank you. In a week's time. Goodbye. Are you going with yet? All the other members. What? He's never. What has he left? Sir? I don't know if I'm doing right, but say please no attention to your masters what has happened here this morning. He has suffered much. Today he's very bad. I beg you, sir. You have only to hint a wish, and I would risk my life to gratify it. I can speak the truth. I can't disguise my heart from you. I would die to serve you. What more can I say? Say nothing. <coughs> a week? How can I stand a week? It must be in a week, sir, as we must know in five days. <laughs> now, run, sir. It's Miss Arthur Bride. An author with A.A. Farmer. <coughs> Why, I think what a whole is. Mr. Bride has money, no you. Miss Mallon has food and beauty, but no money. Tit for tat. The deal of heaven's making. Master Farmer, in heaven, so they say. So, what do you reply? It's not for me to say, it's for my daughter. Oh, yes. But you still have the power to advise. Advise? I tell you, Nickleby, there were times when my will carried against everyone's. A mother's family and friends so bad. With power and wealth on their side, just my will on mine. Yes, yes, well, there we are, sure. Your wish is her command. But if it isn't, what if I can't convince her? Well, Miss Gray, shall we say that I see two pictures? <coughs> One of Walter Gray, a fashionable fellow, as he once was, shining in society, in freer air and under brighter skies, who knows, in France, but certainly in luxury. Or another picture, with a churchyard, and a gravestone, and a date, Perhaps two years, perhaps a little less, not more. Now, Mr. Bray, is it really not for you to stay? Is it really for your daughter to decide? You have cheated nature, Mr. Bray. Yes, but Nickleby, is this not cruel? Come to expect me. Mr. Bray, if he marries her, shall you be young and bright and blazing once again? Yes, but still. By this she will be made a widow. If when he dies, she will be made a widow. Yes, you're right. It is for her as well as me. Exactly. And she'll live to thank you. Uh, uh, men, here are two gentlemen. I see the father. <laughs> he used to say, right, that the very sight of you would make me worse. Well, perhaps you'll change your mind on that point. Girls tend to their minds, you know. Oh, you look so tired, my dear. Not me. Oh, yes, you are. You do too much. I wish I could do more. I know. I know, but still you overtax yourself. This wretched life, my love, it's more than you can bear, I'm sure. It's more than I can bear. Five days, then, Mr. Bray. Yes, very well, five days. And if the lady, if the lady can't decide. Oh, <laughs> 
you are the father of this boy, then look, sir, at the wreck he has become. And tell us if you plan to send him back to that vile den my brother took him from. Why a den? Get out, Mr. Nickleby. Now there's a carriage waiting. Everything is proof. Let's take young Master Snorley and be gone. There is. The documents speak clearly. If our pleas won't move this man, then there's nothing to be done. They won't indeed. Have a father to abandon his own child? Come, son, the coach is waiting.
everything with black. I couldn't see.
green. Bang!
as he said so many times. Keep me content with salt food, little wages and no fires. My will, Peg. Peg, I'm nobody but you to stink. My will. And now what's a new mistress, is it? A baby face, John Chit? She won't come in my way, says you. Well, no, she won't. I'll tell you what the boy, she won't. But you, you don't know why. You stuck to me over after grind. You never throw out old pigs neither, because she stuck to you. Tomorrow? Yes, I didn't. I never did know what her second name was. Well, tomorrow? I had no way to know you'd seen it, but now we must be. I must go straight to this. I will see this man, and if there's still one small feeling of humanity still lingering in her doubt, then what am I to do? You are my best friend, human, and I must confess, I don't know what to do. The greater need, then, for a cool home, reason and consideration, thought. But there's only one thing. I can go to and try to reason with her. And point out the horrors that she is hastening. Yes, yes, if that's right, that's great, Miss Phil. And treat her, even now, at least to pause. To pause! Oh, here's a violent man. Here's a violent streak. But still, I like him for it. That is cause enough. Yourself to this man at the altar, solemn words against which 
nature must have been. I think, too, of the days and days with him that stretch before you. Please believe me, the most degraded quality is better than the misery you'd undergo as wife for such a man as this. Believe me, madam. Believe me, sir. This evil, if it is an evil, is of my own seeking. I am impelled by nobody, but follow this course of my own free will. It is my choice. How can you say this? Because it is true. I can't disguise, although perhaps I ought to, that I have undergone great pain of mind since your last year. No, I do not love this gentleman. He knows that and still offers me his hand. Please don't think of me. I can play a love that I don't feel. Do not report this of me, for I couldn't bear it. He's content to have me as I am, and I am happy for that. I will grow happier. Your pride is your happiness. Just, just one week. Postpone this marriage for a, a few days, even just a day. Before you came here, my father was talking of the new life that he would lead. The freedom that will come tomorrow. And he smiled. A smile I haven't seen before. He was smiling, laughing at the thought of open air and freshness. And his eyes were bright and his face lit up. I'll not defer it for an hour. These are just tricks to urge you on. It is no trick. My father is dying, sir. By doing this, I can release him not only from this place, but from the job of death itself. How can you tell me to act otherwise? I don't There's nothing I can say that will convince you. Nothing. Even if I knew a plot that you might be entitled to a fortune that would do all this marriage can accomplish. More. He's calling. What you say is a childish fact. If I can prove to you the things that I know. It would mean nothing. I am happy in the prospect of what I'll achieve so easily. Now I must go to him. We'll never meet again. No. No, of course not. So, the time may come when to remember this interview might drive me mad. Please tell them I looked happy. <laughs>
you, sir? Well, I am very, well, still limping, I observe. But very nearly mended, I assure you. Oh, yes, but still a little, eh, my lord? A little full down, rather. Still out of condition, eh? I'd say, still in very good condition. I'd say nothing much to matter, actually. Oh, upon my soul, I'm glad to hear it. And of course, as your good uh, friend ducks so soon into society, it's all this game to withdraw just long enough for people to get curious, but not for men to have to come to that. Tommy Mark, I never was acquainted to give the vibe of those damn people. The creatures in the papers. I look there every day. Well, look at the papers then. Tomorrow. Or the next day. Glacial bench, gentlemen. Come on, glacial bench now. Oh, what will I see there? Something of interest to you, I'm sure. What's that? Good evening, Bob. My lord. My thanks to you. What should we look for in the papers? Uh, well, it won't be a murder, anything, but something very near with court cuts and blood and bruise. Bruise who? Who do you think? Last bet now, gentlemen. Which last bet? I hope that after all this time you would reconsider. Well, I am not. So, there is your answer. Then I hope you will remember what I said. That if you were to take this course, I should try to prevent you. I'd mind your business if I were you. And leave me to mind mine. It is my business. I should make it so. It's mine already. I'm already more compromised by all this than I ought to be. My lord, I will be straight with you. I am dependent upon you, as you know. But if that is so, then your dependence upon me is ten times greater. Do not interfere with me in this matter, or you will force me to destroy you. And I will. Come on now, gentlemen, last bet now.
daybreak. We walk towards the place of dream. I saw the trees and the fields and the gardens. They all look very beautiful, so he'd never noticed them before. A young dog very soft. No little fear, more a sense of something like regret that it should come to this. Here we are, my lord. My lord, ship. I'm cold. Does strike cool? Come on, hot room. Do you want my cloak? No. <laughs> well, here they are. My lord. It's nothing. Nothing. My lord, they're ready. Ready. A hawk. Just one word. Yes. Hawk, oh, speak quickly. I... You know, I owe Ralph me to be ten thousand pounds. I know. I am not married. That is true. Every day. And being in that state, my debts die with me. What? I, I don't mean we must settle this course just to let you know the terms. My father's will. I die unmarried, and I die a pauper. And my creditors live paupers too. What's this? So either way I'll destroy you, Hawk. Won't I, eh? Begin. Yes, yes, the Mobu, the Lord. <coughs> Proceed. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Means of 
the most wretched and inadequate subsistence. Subsistence! There were women and children in that one town, divided into classes. And reared from infancy to drive most criminal and dreadful trades. How, How the ignorance was punished and never taught. How jail door gaped and gallows loomed for thousands. How many died and sold and had no chance of life. How many who could scarcely go astray turned properly from those who could scarce do otherwise. How much injustice, misery, and wrong there was. And yet how the world rolled on from year to year, alike careless and indifferent, and no man seeking to remedy or address it. When he thought of all this, and selected from the mass the one slight case on which his thoughts were bent, he felt indeed that there was little ground for hope, and little cause or reason why it should not form an act in the huge aggregate of distress and sorrow, and add one small and unimportant unit to the great amount. Thank you. 
did, but I would not go to the adult <coughs> you can't do. Oh, sir. Oh, yes. I see. Oh, this fellow here, he brings with him, you know, this sister as protection. Well, I shouldn't be surprised if he didn't have half a mind to marry Marilyn himself. What's that? Well, why else do you think he's here? Right, for land of my tell you both of you that there's been no one upon. No contract, no engagement. Well, certainly there's no engagement. This young lady is engaged already and about to be a bride. My God. And we demand to speak with her. And to how we're locked together, she and me, and how this little boy was doing. Will you let me speak with her? And I wonder, is there anything else of mine he'd like besides? He wants my bride. Perhaps he likes his death pay and his house refurnished and a few banknotes for shaving paper. He, he shaves that all. Who's the overall? Lord Frederick Verisons. He struck me as a consequence of something I had said concerning a young lady and her brother. So, I have my answer. You must know. Oh, it. yes. You know. For you know everything. Unmarried. And his bills and mine on his account. All insured by you all over town. So what would you say? Um, Ten thousand pounds? You do it. You understand? Yes, I understand. Oh, yes, at last, you understand. I tell you. This should have been for you. I'm sorry, ma'am, to frighten you. He's dead. Oh, yes. He's dead. Indeed. He looked at me, whispered that he couldn't bear to see him, closed his eyes and wouldn't open them again. Oh, I'm so sorry. What is your saying? Oh, man. My pretty little man. Oh, sir. What obligation do you send him? This girl. She's still his bride to be and he shall have her. Oh, she still shall be my bride. My dainty. Now. No. You said you would save him. And you killed him. What is this? What? Me? My chick? Yes. That's what he meant. He meant he couldn't bear to see me married to you. How can you think I could bear it now? Kate downstairs. You will not take her, girl. Uncle, I will. You have no right to do this. I have no right to do this, Uncle, much more than Uncle. You've had to allow what happened to me here. Please, sir. I want him taken from me. Just one word. Not even one. Your bills are now wasted. Your debts will not be paid. Say this. The one great debt of nature. It's not my fault. I didn't say it was. You, you look at me as if you thought I was to blame. I don't. I blame him, Bray. What for? For not... Living an hour longer. Now go home, drive. Ten pounds. Pounds. Ten? What's the matter? Lost something. Something what? It's gone. What is? The deeds is taken. Who has? Peg Slaughter's cue. Oh, Madam Dunn, Peg Slaughter, she robbed me of the deed. I had it here in my pocket, now it's gone. Now come, drive. Let's go. Oh, it'll be. I shouldn't have. Why you locked it? I tell you, Nickleby, I know it's gone, and I take 
something else. You said you'd help me to be married, and it's been prevented by your flesh and blood. I tell you, if I'm going down in this business, you're going to. Right, right. okay. Now, tell me all about it, and we will try and get it back.
Time to go. <laughs> Did Emily. Oh, Mr. Smythe, to your return? Yes. Yes, dear Mr. Smythe, please. Soon. <laughs> Behavior 
four pints of malt liquor day have been insufficient to sustain her. And I remember thinking all the time it was expected. The child of the boy, what would his uncle say? Would it be Pompey you would ask it to be called? Or Alexander? Was it the money that we cared for, Susan? No, it was not. I scorned it. Then what was it, Susan? It was seeing your back turn on us, Uncle. It was feelings. Mom had been quite lacerated. Uh, poor! <laughs> poor Molina is tired. The infant has been rendered most uncomfortable and fragile. Oh, we can forgive all that. And with you, Uncle, we can never quarrel. But never ask me to receive her. For I won't, I won't, I won't. I'm not me, too. Susan, ten weeks. For a week ago last Thursday, she eloped. Eloped? <coughs> That's right. With three sovereigns of mine, eight silver teaspoons, and the proprietor of a traveling service with mustaches and a bottle nose. It was in this room, this very room, I first laid eyes on Miss Fatalka. It is in this room I cast her off forever. Oh, sir, what suffering have you endured? Come on, you'll forgive our hearts, Miss Clay. Oh, and the thing we've nursed in the bosom of this man is that. that <laughs> uh, yes, and that. And uh, oh, absolutely, and that. Seven strike and crook and dog. Indeed. And now, all we pay for, sir, is that you, dear Mr. Lillian, will not give way to unprevailing grief, but seek consolation in the bosom of this family whose arms and hearts are ever open to you. I gave her everything she asked for. She would her in every way. Those teaspoons, but for one example. I feel I'll never make a double knock on my rounds again. I can't see how I manage it. But still, important matters. Certain candidates, first thing in the morning. I shall settle on your children all those monies I once planned to leave them in my will. <laughs> don't argue me, don't protest. That's <laughs> my decision. Oh, oh dear, Mr. Lillian. Pauline Kenwick falls down in your legs, kiss your uncle back and love me. Yes, yes, better of course. Uh, oh, this is happening on which the gods themselves look down. <laughs> <laughs> How many years of scrimping and scraping and calculating for ten thousand pounds? And what I would have done with it. How many proud days would have fallen and smiled? How many spendthrift nobles would have cringed in vain? How many smooth tongued speeches, catches, books, and bleeding letters for ten thousand pounds? And how many mean and paltry lies would have been told? Not by the money lenders, but by his debtors. All of your thoughtless, generous, liberal, dashing folk who wouldn't be so mean as to save a sixpence in the world. Ten thousand pounds. But now I'm firm. I must be. Come what may. Ah. What you're supposed to get, Mr. Square, I should be here present, Mr. Square. Well, go find him.
the village where they'd grown up together. Looks right. That's our garden. That's where we used to play, run and hide. You used to hide. Yes, Mike, we know the game. I think this is climb that tree, that big one over there, to look at young birds in the nest. And he'd shout out, look, Kate, how high I've climbed. And you'd be frightened, and you'd tell me to calm down. You, you wouldn't calm down, but climb even higher, waving all the time. You climb up there. And look, Mike, that was our house where we used to live. That was Kate's room behind that tiny window. I remember still the way the sun would stream in every morning. Every morning? <coughs> Winter too. <coughs> I think I can't remember. I expect it was always summer here. Is it the same? <coughs> when? Is it the same? Things look a little different, Smile. The tree looks small. The garden's become a little overgrown. But still, it is the same. <coughs> you climbed up there. And from the house, they walked on to the churchyard where their father lay, and where Kate and her brother used to run and loiter in the days before they knew what death was, let alone its meaning. Fox Mike. Kate was lost, and we searched for an hour, and we couldn't find her. And at last we found her here beneath that weeping willow, fast asleep. And so our father, who was very fond of her, picked up her sleeping body in his arms, and said that when he died, he wanted to be a very you know, and his dear little child that lay in her head. Remember, Kate? I've heard it told so often, I don't know. You are down there. Yes, so they say. Please don't promise me. What promise? If I can, you know I will. Oh, May. You might not be very dear. As near as possible to the bottom of that tree. Yes, yes uh, of course you will.
for Madeline's with his balance of the benefactors with ties just as strong. And she too has a fortune. So we should stay together. Yes. And when we're staying old folk, we'll look back on these times and wonder that these things could move us. And even who knows, we might thank the cries that bound us to each other and turned our lives into such a current of peace and calm, we'll always be the same. I can't tell you how happy I am that I laughed as you would have me. And you don't at all regret? Oh, no. No, I don't regret. At least, perhaps, no. No, I don't regret, and yes, I hope and pray will never change. Oh, God. I think you know. And then he said he was in Eden.
pretty gal. Uncomfortable. Yes. Here I've been, what is it, six weeks? Following this blessed old gouger. They tell me around regular to see the wire. Worse if he's getting in with an audacious chap like Nickelpin. Never know what he's done with. Or for a penny, you find you in for a pound. I didn't bounce. Not so far with that old nickelby. See how sly and hungry drug down day after day? Learning and flogging, turning and tracking and twining himself about until he found the Christmas papers hidden. Bear the ground for me to work upon. Creeping in a crawling in the glide. <sighs> how everyone's depths he is. Well, so. Also... Pigs as well, cows as well. Boy, this is bobbish. Young Mark's a bit of winking at him. Oh, I'll wake you one on the back. I'm coming with his sister sniffing while eating his dinner. Seeing the beef was so strong and made him. Oh, Cobby, make a sniff a little out of your beef. Pitcher was took with another fever, so he would be. Fetched five friends. Died the minute he got home, of course he did, to aggravate us. Ain't another lad in old school but that boy would arrange to die directly at quarter's end. If that's not spite and malice, then I don't know what is. Well, right, so. You know, I'm trying to wait on the old woman. Pretty sure if I have succeeded all, I'll shout tonight. Did you 
Is all right? He said it was his beauty. Well, he's got his beauty now. That's both of them. I want to say to the man, come at age of Mary, the said man. <laughs> That's it. The way you're going. Okay, What's that got to you? I'm leaving Miss Slice.
poses. They all call for me and shun me like the plague. How have they changed? These men who used to lick the dust from my feet. But I will know what it is. I must, at any cost. And so Ralph is at home once again. And cross the river. And determine now to have them everything came to me. Who made me a fellow such as this? 
If I could sell my soul for a drink, why wasn't I a thief, a swindler, a robber of pence from the trays of blind men's doors rather than your drudgeon pack horse? If my every word was indeed a lie, why wasn't I a pet and favorite of yours, a liar? When did I ever fall and cringe to you? I serve you faithfully. You were talking just now about tampering. Who tampered with me? The Yorkshire schoolmaster? Who tampered with a jealous father, urging him to send his daughter to old Aunt Bride? Oh, and then tampered with Bride, too, and did so in an office with a little closet in the room? Ah, ha, ha, you mind me now. And what first set the drudge to listening at doors and watching close and following? The master's cruel treatment of his flesh and blood, his vile designs upon a young girl, which only made the miserable and drunken hex stay on in service in the hopes of doing a son good, when he might have otherwise relieved his feelings by pummeling his master soundly and then going to the devil. <laughs> I'm here now because these gentlemen thought it best. When I sought them out as I did, there was no tempering me. I told them I wanted help I knew of, to track you down, to, to finish what I had begun, to help the right. And that when I'd done so, I, I burst into your room and I'd face you man to man, and like a man. And now, I've done it. Now I've had my say. Let anybody else say that I've done. At last. <coughs> so far away. Yes, yes, go on, go on. It is, uh, simply talk. We knew about the deed and how Gride had acquired it. And we heard from the neighbours of the great to-do Gride had made when it was gone. Our dear friend Mr. Noggs acquainted us with Squeer's visit to you. And while you and he pursued Peg's line askew, we in our turn followed you and then the schoolmaster and found the house in Lambeth and procured a warrant for their arrest for possession of a stolen document. Which said was done. The woman, the schoolmaster, and most of all, the deed are now in police possession. Well now, sir, you've heard it. How far you're implicated in this matter, you best know. <coughs> but we would not, well, we would not see an old man like you disgraced or vanished. Sirs, you have not the man to deal with that you think you have. What's this? Only that I have not heard one word of proof against any of these wild allegations. That I spit on your fair words and your false dealings. And that there is a law still to be had, and I will call you. Take care, sirs. You have said enough already. I would advise you to say no more. Would you mean not said enough? No, no, indeed. Sir, what would you say if we said this man snorting had confessed? Oh, then. Then I'd say that this snorting was a frightened coward, and that this confession was most likely dragged from him. And if we told you that the boy was dead? You mean, simple to me. He's dead, indeed. Well, <laughs> oh, gentlemen, I forgive you for everything. For this news, I am in your debt and bound for you for life. Oh, Captain, it's, it's so unnatural. It is. Oh, what's this? Have you not dragged up another? Have you dragged up my nephew to add to all of these lies? What? Here. Do you know this man is a convicted criminal, a felon? You asked, sir, for our proof that broken boy was not the son of Snowley. Yes, I did. Well, well our proof is not concerned with confessions or papers. It is that we know the boy was another son. Another? Whose? Yours. What? Do you remember? Thirty years ago, family in Leicestershire, a father and a daughter, a father who you wound into your nephew who cheated like you cheated. But a daughter would have grown attached to you because he was young then. Arming in his way, and she could not believe he was not their family's benefactor. 
and who fell in love with you right here. Mary, but of course it had to be a secret from the father. He was rich, and if he'd known, the daughter would have lost a great inheritance, and that would never do. Oh, for so a secret way, a little secret son, put off to nurse a long way off so as not to interfere. Then as time went on, began to see her less and less. Stay up in London, baby. Money. Your wife, a young girl alone in a dull old country house, and eventually she couldn't bear it any longer, could she? And so she ran off, didn't she? And you sent me to fetch the boy to keep him from her, didn't you? And you used me here and cruelly. The boy was hidden in an alley. Neglected me in sickly. Doctor said he must have a change of air or else he'd die. You went away six weeks. When you returned, I told you the child was dead. You, I think, realized you missed him when he'd gone. You missed someone who thought well of you. Frightened up your house and made his laughter in your halls and you missed him. Didn't you? So the boy was not then dead. Sir, so I offer no excuses for myself. You could say I was harshly treated, driven from my real nature. But I'm guilty. Yes, I stole the boy, took him to a Yorkshire school. Paid his fees for six years, and then went away. Came back. I went to look for him. I couldn't find him there. He'd gone. <coughs> Came up to London and confronted him. No use. Within a month, six weeks ago, I saw the boy. He was sitting in a garden. I knew his face. He had a big new mind. The school was run by your friend, Mr. Wackford Squeers. I gave the boy a name. Do I need to tell you? Like unhappy man. Yes, but doubly, triply, ten times more unhappy <coughs> must you be, Ralph Nickleby.
Ralph came home. He can to make up his mind. Turn the key. Open up the door. And we have and close it with a crash behind me. and climbed to the very top, to the front gate, which was now a lumber room. Here, Ralph remained. I know this room. This room is where he slept. I was his father. And he did not die for me. And he didn't die for me. We died elsewhere. If we hadn't, if we have been recovered to each other, I might have been a different man. A man more like my brother or my nephew. But no, to be held up in the worst and most repulsive of camps, and to know know that he was taught to hate my very name, Nickleby. Ah, there came one evening 
Her favor of Mr. Lincoln, what? An invitation from the Brothers Cheerio for dinner on the next day but one. An invitation comprehending not just Nicholas, his mother, and his sister, but their great friend, Miss Lockfreedy, too. Who, much to the astonishment of Mrs. Nickleby, was most particularly mentioned. Now, we took the liberty, dear friends, of naming one hour before dinner, as we had a little business to discuss which would occupy the interval. I wanted to. Would you be so kind as to escort dear Mrs. Nickleby and uh, Mrs. Freebie too to show them something of the house and perhaps to tell them something too? It would be my great pleasure, ma'am. And, ma'am. Well, certainly. That's I... another word. <laughs> <laughs> Now, Kate, have you seen Miss Madden since your return to London? No, and I have not heard from her. Well, that's not heard from her. Do you hear that, Brother Ned? Is that not sad? Oh, yes, dear Charles. Very sad indeed. Yes, the whole thing was so upsetting that you'll forgive me. Just for a moment, I withdraw myself into another room. Poor <laughs> Ned, oh, poor Brother Ned, as I've remarked you before, sir, often. Always such a prey to his emotions. Now, we are engaged, I think, upon the topic of Miss Mac, who, as you know, becomes entitled upon her marriage to a certain sum of money. Yes, we know that. In fact, a sum amounting to 12,000 pounds from the will of Madeline's maternal grandmother. Uh, one could say, quite a dowry. Mm -hmm. uh, sir, you did receive our letter. Yes, yes, we did. You both explained your feelings, yours for Miss Madeline, and Kate's for nephew Frank. You have resolved, however, despite those feelings, to reject all thoughts of love and matrimony and to live instead just for each other. Yes, that is our resolve. A noble sentiment. But still, perhaps, a selfish one. Oh, selfish? Why? Why, because of other people's feelings. Those, for an instance, of brother getting time. I'm sorry, I don't understand. You don't? You don't see why we are offended? To have it thought that your love for Madeline or Kate's for Frank had anything to do with money? Come, sir, how could you think so? We did not think so, sir. And worse than that, much worse. To think that you yourselves would be corrupted or debased by marrying the people whom you set your hearts upon. Sirs, I had thought we'd made it plain. We have, my sister and I, have learned nothing in our journey, and so strongly as we've learned what happens to the kindest and noblest and generous people when their souls are tainted by the touch of money. We have seen our father and our uncle, sirs, one who was most dear to us, the other one who should have been destroyed. One in the want of money, and the other by the having it and loving it too much. Oh, Kate, Nicholas, how can you be so blind? They stand in front of you. Now, no, I... Uncle Ned, you cannot say it. You cannot say it, Uncle Charles, but I can. But you see in front of you, Kate and Nicholas, two men who walked barefoot to London, penniless and hungry, and who made their fortune. Have they been tainted or debased? Have they been made ignoble or unkind? Yes, yes, returned most unexpectedly, without so much as a presentiment. As is his wont. And with him and someone else whose feelings we might take into account. Oh, ma'am. Uh, you've heard all this? Yes, I have. And you? They told you have everything? Yes, they did. Sirs, I told you in confidence my feelings for Miss Madeline. I have no idea, of course, if they, if she, what feelings she has entertained. Uh, <laughs> do you understand? <laughs> I understand what I have understood since we first met. And I understand that since then you have changed. Oh, no. And that you cannot see me anymore, but only my inheritance. Nicholas, some of it's been through what you've been through. Strip as you've striven, and learn what you've learned. Think that it is right to sacrifice our happiness for such a superstition. But if there are any barriers, we can't surmount. Our happiness? How could you ever think I felt otherwise? We're overruled. Sir, we see. And so it is. And so it is. from 
want to be a respectable and normal member of society. And I'm sure Mrs. Nickleby agrees. Oh, brother. Yes, I, I mean, if I lost my view, I am. Oh, wait. <laughs> <laughs> Mrs. Nickleby, Mrs. Nickleby. Now, now, isn't it a pleasant thing? To people like us, to see young people we are so fond of brought together. Yes, it is. Indeed. Although, although it almost makes one feel oneself quite uh, solitary, almost cast away. Now, I don't know if you feel that. Why, certainly that's true. Well, I mean, it's true that I don't know. Well, it's... It's almost something that would make one think of getting wet oneself, now isn't it? They're nonsense, Mr. Nick and Walter. Is it nonsense? Is it really? <coughs> Now, Mr. Lincoln, what are you all mocking me? No, 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 I'm not. Why, how we make people laugh? Well, let them. We'll laugh back. <laughs> we <can't laughs> get back. <laughs> what would the brother say? Oh, why, Mrs. McCready, bless your soul. You don't suppose I think of a thing like that without their knowing it. They left us here together on purpose. Oh, I can never look them in the face again. <laughs> Be a comfortable couple. You shall live in this old house and sit and talk or sit and sit <laughs> quite calm and perfectly contented. Oh, oh, let's be a comfortable couple, that's my dear. No, oh, Mr. Lake and Walter, since you put it in that most affecting fashion, yes. Well, there is not, I swear.
in the paper? No. Well, that's a wonder. It was there in the varieties. Oh, good. I have it here. <laughs> the talented Vincent Crummles, long favorably known to fame as a country manager and actor of no ordinary sentence, is about to cross the Atlantic on a histrionic expedition. Crummles is to be accompanied, we hear, by his wife and gifted family. Crummles <laughs> is quite certain to succeed. A marriage! That's right. But with, uh, with all the company. Oh, well, no. In fact, sir, I must own our numbers have been much depleted since we saw you last. Finance, sir, the main cause always finance. But there have been departures, too, of course. Old Fluggers joined the church by reasons of his years of practicing, and Tom <laughs> Collaire has affected to a company that found spectaculars hard by the bridge at Waterloo. <laughs> Attracted by the glitter, sir, and the promises of quick and easy fame. Well, he'll find out, of course. <gasps> and even this may upset you rather more. Miss Snevalici left us. Her. Miss Snevalici? Yes to marry the good-looking young wax chandler who supplied with candles to the Portsmouth Theatre. But apparently, the lyrics may have it. Ah. Yeah, so we thought. We have a fair start. The Americans are much devoted to grand gesture and the melodrama, and I heard on much the best authority that they'll pay anything. <laughs>
acquired in writing to his wife. He invested in the firm of the Jirical Brothers, in which Frank had become a partner. And before many years had passed, the business began to be run under the names of Jirical and Nickleby. So that Mrs. Nickleby's prophetic anticipations were to be realized at last. The twin brothers retired. Who needs to be told that they were happy? They were surrounded by happiness of their own creation and lived but to increase it. Nicholas's first act, when he became a rich and prosperous merchant, was to buy his father's old farm. And soon he and his wife were blessed with a group of lovely children. And within a stone's throw there was another such retreat, enlivened by children's voices too. And here lived Kate with many new cares and occupations. But still, the same true loving creature and the same gentle sister as in her girlish days. And Mrs. Nickleby lived sometimes with her daughter and sometimes with her son. And spent much time relating her experience. Especially on the matter of the management and bringing up of children. With much importance and celebrity. And there was one grey haired, white, harmless gentleman who lived in a little cottage hard by Nicholas's house and in his absences attended to the supervision of affairs. His chief delight and pleasure was the children. With whom he became a child himself and master of the rebels. The little people could do nothing without dear old human dogs. And as time went on, the house in which young Kate and Nicholas had spent their childhood was enlarged and altered to accommodate the growing family. But no old rooms were ever pulled down. No old tree was rooted up. Nothing with which there was the least association of old bygone times. 